everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, so without further ado, let's get talking about activity streams. Uh, the talk today is activating your site, a look into activity streams uh, prevented, presented by us. Um, we're going to go over briefly what they are, how you can implement them, and why you should care about putting them on your site. Uh, so just briefly, uh, I'm Justin Ben Farhan. Uh, we are all uh, work at National Geographic, which uses a lot of Django on some of our sites, uh, and we've been doing this for a while. Um, so again, here's the agenda. Uh, we're going to talk about activity streams, what they are, uh, why you should care about them on your site, some of the uh, engineering concerns around implementing them, um, and then we're going to talk through um, the open specification regarding activity streams, and then uh, two solutions, one expressly in Django, and the other one as a service that can work for any website. So what are activity streams? So they're actually everywhere. Uh, so GitHub, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera. Um, you probably run into them one of these at least once today. Um, they essentially are, are a way of displaying uh, actions that people take on your site. Um, and uh, they also have a way that people can somehow like socially link themselves to other people who are also making activities and amplify the amount that they're seeing in their stream. So why do all this stuff? What's the point to all this? And it actually turns out that it's really good at increasing engagement on your site. So even if something as simple as putting a like button on your site will drive tra traffic immensely because essentially people like clicking on things. Uh, we tried this out on Nat Geo and uh, just very basic without getting any a lot of like user feedback or anything like that. People just like clicking things and say yes, they approve this content or whatever. Um, and also, so that's the first half of being able to publish your, your activities to a site. The other half is being able to consume them and see what your friends are doing. And with those two in combination, you actually set up a really powerful positive feedback loop that will drive lots and lots of more content and engagement on your site. And that's a really great thing to do. Um, but in terms of engineering, we get a lot of data out of it. Hooray data. And with that data, we do a lot of fun stuff, including tons of analytics. You can drive recommendations like, um, like Netflix, uh, show you related content. We have social graph app apps. Uh, we can show you trending, can drive A-B testing, and tons more. Um, but there are some uh, engineering considerations that have to be taken into account in implementing this. And uh, Ben's going to dive into that a bit more. Hi. So um, these are just some of the problems that are presented with activity streams. Uh, there are no great solutions to this. It's not a simple, clear-cut answer. But um, it's all about, you know, weighing the benefits of each one of them. I'm going to dive into a little, um, into one of these, into each one of these a little bit. So the first problem is too many peppers. Essentially, there are so many implementations of activity streams out there, and that's kind of evil. We don't really get the benefit of cross-site implementation. It would be really great if I could do an activity on Facebook or somewhere else and then get that same thing at National Geographic or another site. Um, it causes duplication of work, and there's no common semantic structuring so it's kind of hard to implement these things and come up with the terms on your own every time. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the solution to that in a little bit. So um, the second problem that we might face is what do we actually store and what type of data structure and in what schema? Is this going to be a relational database, a non-relational database? What's the data structure? There's different things in terms of efficiency that could come into this. Are we doing an adjacency list, an adjacency matrix, a doubly linked list, something else, a key value store, just a hash? Um, are you going to have more writes or reads? So if you're a social media company, you might show the news feed a lot, and then you are, you're going to have a lot of reads. If you are a, con a company like National Geographic, you know, there's mostly content. I'm not going to show you the news feed that much, and I'm going to have a lot more writes. And then, do I store the activities in the same place that I store the actual stream? Where was it pre-computed or something like that? I'm going to touch that in a little second. So, um, another problem is centrality versus sparsity. Uh, haters going to hate. You're always going to have your celebrities. So those are people who have a lot of followers or do a ton of activities. And the reverse to that, which is sparsity, you know, forever alone. I only have one friend or I've only done one activity. Um, and each of these things present a different problem. Uh, for instance, for the celebrity, do you start to enforce limits? At some point, that's going to be too much to compute. Um, Facebook, if I remember correctly, has a limit for 5,000 friends. And do you solve that with a data limit? Is that a hard limit? Or do you do some sort of UX solution where you hide the follow button at some point? And then the other way, it, you know, the other problem is, 
what do I show a person that has one friend? What do I show a person that's only done one activity? Am I going to show them a stream with that one thing, um, a, a stream that has only that one friend's activities? Scalability, obviously an important factor here. You know, what am, I, what am I dealing with? Am I dealing with a massive amount of activities or just a few? Where do I do this computation? Am I offloading it to somewhere else? Am I doing that inside the request response cycle or doing something else with it? And how do I handle complex queries like friends of friends or follows or um, recommendations? And then uh, real-time versus pre-computed. When do you do your computation is an important factor. Are you pushing out in real-time? If so, how do things take precedence? And are you doing some sort of half and half um, where you're pre-computing some stuff and then computing on the fly for other things? And what are you actually sending? Are you just calculating the ranking of things? Are you doing the entire thing, including the HTML, and then just sending that off? What are you really going to, um, to compute? So I'd like to invite Justin back on, and we're going to talk a little bit about the solutions to these things and some of the implementations that we came up with. So there is a solution for some of these problems. Um, it turns out there's an open uh, specification called the Django, the uh, activity stream specification uh, that aims to solve at least, you know, the varied implementations by solidifying everybody on one uh, semantic structure and then the data and how it's stored. And so this has actually been around for a while uh, and all of these companies uh, here are implementing it in some fashion or another. Uh, we implement this at National Geographic and the other solutions we show you today also implement it. Um, it supports uh, Atom and JSON uh, data structures out of the box um, and uh, in a, a human-friendly, machine-processable way. Um, quick disclaimer, nobody up here is officially involved with the specification. We're just implementers who are showing our, um, or sharing our experience with you about this. So the uh, spec looks a little bit like this. So there are three big entities. Um, the actor, which is the required one, normally that's the user on your site, is whatever's taking that particular action. Um, the verb phrase, which is uh, whatever uh, actually happens, like commented, post. Um, the spec defines a whole list of officially supported verbs, um, but for sites, most of the sites I've seen this implemented, they take those, and then the ones that aren't there, they sort of just run with and customize their own. There's an official channel to go back and propose verbs that aren't there to the draft specification, which I encourage you to do on their website. Um, you also have an action object, which is the primary object of the activity, whatever gets created, essentially, whether it's a, a photo in an album or a comment on a blog post. Um, and the last, last entity is the target, is wherever that action is taking place. You know, it could be in, like, like the album or the blog post, wherever the action is going. Um, and then there's a little bit of meta information, like well, what the timestamp is uh, and a descriptive title and summary. And so this is what the JSON... Uh, implementation looks like, uh, real quickly, a uh, quick example. Uh, you see that the actor, object, and target have their own uh, JSON object right in there. Um, and we sort of stuck to sort of like JSON as the first class citizen for the rest of our implementations. So um, I'm going to talk to you right now about Django Activity Streams, which is a, uh, an open source project that I wrote uh, and has been used in several different sites. So it uses the specification. Uh, it can track any uh, object in your Django project. Uh, it runs on any supported Django database, uh, and it keeps track of everything using generic foreign keys. Uh, it pro also provides a way for you to render these streams onto your site using template tags or uh, feeds. Um, everything's generated at request time, and I leave the caching up to you. Uh, and you can read along uh, with the uh, source code at my uh, GitHub repository, or also read the docs. So. When I'm not working at uh, National Geographic, I'm CTO of Narwhal Studios, which is the gaming company that uh, runs the Humans vs. Zombies game. And HVZ is essentially an uh, organized game of tag that's played at colleges, universities, and other locations all over the world. And uh, we deal with like thousands of players doing hundreds and hundreds of actions a day. And uh, we needed a way to sort of give that feedback and show people their streams. Um, and so this is HVZ Source, the uh, Django site that we set up to help moderate that game. Um, and you can see a simple action right here is just the row. Uh, crazy face, the actor, uh, selected the verb. Uh, the original zombie is the object. And the demo game is the target. And then the timestamp is in the time since filter, all displayed right there. Um, so behind the scenes, it uses two models to accomplish everything. The main action model has generic foreign keys named actor, target, and action object that can point to any object in your Django database. It doesn't have to be a user. It also has that 
uh, descriptive meta information I was talking about as well. Uh, the second model is follow. Uh, it has a foreign key to your user, whether that's Django auth user or it also supports a custom user, that's up to you. And then a generic foreign key pointing to any other entity that you'd like to follow. It doesn't have to be user, it could be anything else. And uh, it maintains that relationship in the database. So uh, generating actions is pretty simple. You just import the uh, signal and send it along with the arguments. So crazy face is the actor first and foremost. And then all the other arguments are sent in as keyword arguments. So crazy face selected the original zombie for the target, which is demo game. Follow, following and unfollowing is similarly um, also simple. There's just a follow and unfollow function that take a user first and then an entity second and either create or destroy that uh, follow object. And there's also followers and following, uh, which would return a query set of uh, users that follow that given entity or the other one does the reverse lookup and gives you a list of entities that that user is following. Um, and of course there are streams. What good is this app if you can't show it? So it comes with a few built-in streams, um, user stream being the most important one uh, that takes a user, finds their, your, their followers, and then gives you actions that those followers have done. That's like your main dashboard of GitHub or Facebook or Twitter, that's probably the most important one. And then there's similar other ones that are actor, target, and action object that just do a similar lookup based uh, whatever context that that given object is, is in, in that action. So uh, actor stream of crazy face will show me all of the actions where crazy face was the actor. Uh, model stream is another interesting one. It'll show you any and all content or any and all actions that involve a particular content type. So this will show me anything that is happening with any user model. And so if I were to graph out the interesting one, the uh, user stream query, essentially you're given the, uh, the user object. It goes and finds your followers, or the, sorry, the, the content that you follow, and then it reverse looks up uh, the actions that were um, involved with those objects. Uh, and it can also filter it down by relationship. Uh, by default, the user stream just returns everything wherever your uh, follower was involved in, but you can customize that as well. Um, so those only get you so far. Uh, there's also uh, custom streams, which are easily to implement. Uh, so basically, uh, this first one right here, uh, player actions, takes a game instance, uh, it finds out the number of player IDs that are in this game, and then it returns a query saying, uh, show me all the actions where the players of this game were the actor. And it does that by object ID and content type. Um, the stream decorator gets you a little power where uh, it will, you can just return query set arguments or a keyword argument filter. Um, you don't have to return a query set. Um, and then the second example here is the player actions by slug. Uh, it simply does the same thing that the first one was doing, only it takes a slug instead of an instance. Uh, I'm going to get back to that guy a bit later about why that's useful. So to graph that out, it looks pretty similar to the first example. You're given a game, you find the players in that game, and then you do a reverse lookup to find out where those players made specific actions when they were the actor. Uh, so it's a little, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's the generic foreign keys work from the uh, player objects to the actions uh, and keep track of the relationship that way. Um, so the first way to put this on your site is uh, using template tags. And the activity stream uh, template tag is the most helpful because that essentially takes, the first argument is the name of the stream you're interested in, like the actor stream, then uh, any arbitrary objects you want to pass in through that tag. Uh, this returns a stream object in context which you can iterate over and display however you want. There's a helper built in called display action which is just an include tag. Uh, with that uh, renders a specific template that you can override in your project, uh, but you can also display this however you want on your site. Um, it also works for custom streams, so you just give it the name of your custom stream, pass in a game instance, and you are golden. Uh, the second sort of overall function that the templates give you is ability to create follow uh, buttons. So this guy essentially is a, a, a link that's a toggle. If you're not following this person, it will give you a link to follow them. If you are following this person, it will give you a link to unfollow them. It's sort of like the toggle that you see on GitHub or any other uh, social media sites. The second way to get uh, information out of the app is through feeds. Um, so the user feeds, first and foremost. Um, it, uh, any of these support either uh, Adam or Jason uh, for the user feed as long as you're authenticated and go to that URL, it will return out uh, the user feed in the machine readable format. 
uh, object feed uh, does a lookup for a specific object by content type and object ID and then returns you a stream of actions where they participated in that in any, any relationship. Model feed, just like I showed you, just does uh, everything based on the content type. Uh, interestingly, you can also add uh, custom JSON feeds like this. Like I showed you with the game slug, um, the second uh, custom one before, you can actually pass URL parameters directly into your streams and render things out through a custom JSON feed that way. Um, so in implementing this, I ran into a couple uh, database considerations that are important to note. So um, if you were to write this thing uh, naively uh, and write this out in a template, uh, you'd essentially get one query for getting all your actions, and then as you were iterating, you would do a hit to the database for every actor, every target, and every action object. And this gets incredibly complex after a while. So luckily in versions of Django uh, 1.4 and newer, you have prefetch related, which essentially combines it all and it just has big O of C, where C is the number of content types overall. So it drastically reduces the number of database queries. It makes the queries a bit beefier. And then Django gets that information back from the database and then shuffles everything together in Python to give you your final query set. So um, Django Activity Streams use this under the hood. You don't have to worry about this, um, but you can extend it if you'd like uh, further on. Also, since we're dealing with generic foreign keys, there are some limitations. Um, like the aggregation and annotation API of Django will not work for generic foreign keys that I found. Uh, so like this guy right down here that tries to find a count of actors whose health is greater than five just will, will not work. So this leaves, unfortunately, this leaves out a lot of the interesting things like um, uh, recommended content, um, like uh, most popular, like a lot of the more interesting queries that you'd like to get a handle on, it sort of falls short, and you have to do a lot of ugly SQL to get things the way you want to do. Um, so there's a sort of a better way to do it, and that's what we've been using at National Geographic. Uh, we've been uh, working on the Horizon service, uh, and I'm going to toss this back to Ben to tell you a bit more about it. Hello again. <clears throat> so a little bit of background about the Horizon service. Um, like Justin said, if you're building an app which just needs an activity stream, his project is awesome for that. Um, we have a large ecosystem. We don't really have control over the models that exist within the different sites that we have. And so we needed some solution that was able to deal with this type of stuff as a service. Um, we have a great product owner that basically told us there are three different implementations of favoriting right now. Build me one. And so we built a, a service, and it follows the activity stream spec or tries to. Um, there's some limitations with uh, some of the solutions that we chose. It does a half and half sort of real time versus pre-compute mix. And what's important to know is that if you want to use this, your models must have an API. We'll talk more about why um, in a minute, but that is a requirement. And then there's clear separation between uh, front end and back end modules that come together with this. And this, again, is open source. So a little electrical circuit for you about the Horizon ecosystem. Uh, I'm going to dive a little bit into those, and we'll talk about them. But first, storage considerations. Uh, first thing we look at was, what do we store this in? And a graph database really is perfectly suited for these types of things. Um, and for making interesting queries. It's optimized for large traversals. It's really good at storing the relationships, and we can look at individual slices based on different things, which I'll talk a little bit about um, in terms of the choices that we made. So Neo4j was our um, product that we chose to use for this, the database. We looked at others, but eventually chose Neo4j. It's based on Tinkerpop, which is a Java framework uh, for property graphs. Titan, which is another graph database, also uses the same thing. Property graph is essentially a graph database that allows you to have properties on both nodes and edges. And underneath the hood, it implements a doubly linked list as its data structure for relationships, and nodes are just pointers to their first relationship, and that's how they traverse. Um, in terms of complexity, indexing and search are a little bit costly because it's a doubly linked list. It has a big O of N, where N is the number of edges. But, and then for, for insert and delete, it's constant speed. But Neo4j actually uses Lucene on top of things, so when you start, we can start talking about indexing and search, it gets a much better result. But what do we actually store? So we don't want to store your entire model. We can't actually store your entire model. Our situation is one where 
there's multiple models. We could have a photo in one site described completely different from a photo in another site. And in trying to solve that and in using the, ba the, the best practices for something like Neo4j, we decided on five basic properties for nodes. Those are API. Um, if you remember, I talked about you needing an API route for your models. Um, an AID, your application ID. A type of app label model name, so let's say YouTube underscore video. Created and updated timestamps. And then that's, that could be an actor, an object, a target, or anything else in your graph. That's the only, stuff, that's the only uh, thing that we store. For edges, it's a little bit different. Um, Neo4j has a native type. So that could be followed, favorited, um, liked, watched, so on. And then a created and updated timestamp. We also use Redis. Um, we use Redis for sockets, sessions, caching, and then some stream data. It's really good for that type of stuff, and um, there's not much to say except that it's an excellent database. And then uh, back to this part, I'm going to talk a little bit about the pre-compute cycle. So um, we said that you have to make a choice between real-time and pre-compute. We said that we chose half and half. We use Apache Storm. Uh, I don't know if you're, you're familiar with it. It's a really great product. It's like Hadoop, but for real-time message processing. It's not a dependency, but a recommendation. And the way that Storm works is it has these topologies. Essentially, topologies, um, or, or Storm in general, is a processing framework that is distributed and really good at doing these types of things uh, for processing messages. It has topologies that describe a set of processes. Those are called bolts. And you could have multiple topologies. You upload a topology by just uploading a jar file into the Storm cluster, and then it runs those things. It internally can run not only Java, but Python, uh, JavaScript, C Sharp, whatever you want. And communication to it is done via message queue. Um, we use Kafka or RabbitMQ for some certain things. Storm topologies are really good because we had a problem to solve, which is um, one part of our company might want to have larger weights on videos, and another part of our company might want to have larger weights on articles. And in order to do that type of co uh, calculation and computation, we can create many different storm topologies that basically define different processes to eventually get us the data that we want for each one of these streams. Um, all of that is dumped eventually into Redis. And I think I said this, but I'll say it again. This is not a dependency, but a recommendation. You could do everything on the fly for the, for the Horizon ecosystem. So Horizon itself is built on Node and Sales, which is an MVC framework. And I'm going to dive a little bit into the API for it. So it supports multiple content models um, with the use of the simple namespacing, which is the app label model name, and allows uh, access to activities from different viewpoints. You could look at things from the actor viewpoint, from an object viewpoint. That'll make a little bit more sense in a second. Um, and then uh, target and so on. Here's an example call for you. So um, we're at version one of the API. And if you go to object, YouTube, video, one, and then favorited, essentially you're going to look at every activity that is of the type favorited that has been done on YouTube video one. Um, and we're looking at that from the direction of the object. So I'm asking what has been done to me, the object. And uh, on the right, you can see that we uh, follow the spec. And you see the little data parameter there. That's actually an after effect of Neo4j. Uh, which we're working to overcome, but uh, so we try and solve, follow the spec to some degree. Um, here's some more examples. If I did actor auth user one favorited YouTube video, and then if you go to that YouTube video, you'll find something funny. Um, that would return a specific activity as ascribed by the spec. And if you went to the object YouTube video with that ID favorited auth user, I would see all the activities done to an object by a specific type of user. And that's useful for counts, for instance. The thing to remember here is that direction actually matters when dealing with graph databases. So if I look at things from the point of view of an actor, it's not the same as looking at it from the point of view of an object. I'm asking different questions. And actually, within the graph databases, uh, sorry, within the graph database, edges have direction. Um, so if I'm asking, I'm an object, what have I done? I'll probably get nothing, because most YouTube videos can't like things. Uh, but if I'm an actor and I'm looking at it from that direction, then I'll be able to get some results. Posting, really easy, API v1 activity. Basically, the payload looks more or less like the data that we store. Um, and then we do manipulations on top of that for the pre-compute stuff. 
And you could even do complex stuff. So we created a controller that's uh, called proxy controller. There's also a reverse proxy controller. This facilitates stuff like follow. So in this graph example, you have a proxy that could be you. And let's say I've the proxy verb that I do is followed. And whoever I followed, that could be actors or objects or whatever, what I'm going to get back is a list of all of the activities that those actors have done on objects. Um, the return call would look pretty much the same. The return result will look pretty much the same as what I showed you earlier, except that in this case, I'd have multiple actors doing the activity. So what are the problems that we run into uh, something like this? First of all, we have no control over external data. Um, if, a, if, a, if a photo changed its title, I don't know about it. So you really need to live in an ecosystem that allows you to get that data back and to inform you of such changes. Um, second problem that we have is that graph databases don't really have a great ecosystem yet. So adapters are not that great. There's no real graph ORM. And I know because I wrote some of those adapters. Um, and then front end versus back end computation. Um, I heard that I missed a great talk this morning um, about where to do the computation. And that's a real consideration. Do you do the entire stream processing on the back end? Do you send it up to the front end to do, uh, to do some of the computation? And that leads me actually to the next part, uh, which is going to be Farhan. Farhan uh, worked on every part of this uh, ecosystem, but he's going to talk about the front end modules and how they relate to this ecosystem. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so what are the client-side modules? Uh, so you see there's the stream and snippet. Um, that's just the names we call them. And they're just standard web front-end technologies, HTML, JavaScript, CSS. Um, and they allow you to communicate with the Horizon service so by sending actions and by consuming actions. So let's dive in. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the snippet. It's like a like button. It's a very configurable like button. Um, the snippet is responsible for representing a specific verb that an actor can take on a specific object. Um, and it's also responsible for displaying some state about the activity of a specific object, like counts. Um, so here's some representations of those. And it's also an open source process. Please check it out. And this entire thing is built with just vanilla JS. Um, so say I have a web application, and say I have an awesome picture of me and Lombard Burton. Um, and I want other users to tell me, hey, if I like this, t t let me know if you like this picture. So on my blog or on my uh, web application, I can just add this div, and the snippet will be more or less up here. And you can see the div is pretty standard. We're using standard HTML data attributes. There's an object type, and there's, again, the app label underscore model name, the AID, which is the application ID, so wherever, whichever application has the storing this photo. And then the object ape, uh, endpoint. Um, we'll come back to that later. That's really important. Um, and then the data verb. And as you can see, a snippet is kind of mapped to an object. Um, and, that, and the snippet and the stream have this concept of context. Um, the snippet, since it represents an action you can take on an object, you need to ask the question, well, who's taking the action? And a lot of times, it's going to be a user, an, an actor of some kind. So most likely, it'll be a user, but it could be really anything. And we mentioned it was highly configurable. So the data verb attribute actually maps to a template. And so you can kind of really easily customize how a verb looks differently and, how, and even the business logic that encapsulates it. Um, and it's really easy to add, create your own verbs at the very bottom. Say your application needed a new verb pipered, you know, whatever that means for your application, you can very easily add an attribute, make sure you have a template that's associated with it, and then you will get a custom verb. So let's look at kind of how this all works and how they are kind of look like the request response cycle. Um, so let's say I have the snippet, it has counts of eight, and the user clicks the snippet. This sends a post request to the same endpoint, and this is basically the payload. Again, it's pretty, it, we try to be really consistent. So it's AID, API, type, app name, model name. The Horizon service returns an OK. The snippet is updated with the new state, the heart is filled in, and the count is all, is all there. Um, so I just showed you one example of like one snippet on a page, and it's like, hey, can there be multiple snippets on the page? Can multiple snippets be pointing to the same object? Yes, they can. We kind of solve a lot of these issues because of the variety in National Geographic. 
you know, we didn't design all the all the front end web pages, so we need to have a way where these can all talk really easily to each other and communicate. So, yes, one object can be represented by multiple snippets, and multiple snippets can represent multiple ob objects on the same page, and they all work fine. So that's pretty much the snippet. We're going to get talk about the stream now. So if the snippet was actions you can take, the stream is consuming. It's like it's the news feed. It's it's a highly configurable news feed. It, it displays it displays activities um, based on an actor. Um, unlike the snippet, which is built in vanilla, this is built with just um, Backbone. And again, it's an open source repo. So let's show you what the stream looks like. Uh, right now you're viewing the stream of Lucas uh, Servan, who's one of the de developers at National Geographic. And you can see kind of the structure of the stream. Lucas Servan, the actor, favorited the verb, the article, digging Utah's dinosaurs. And on NGM is like the target in that case, on some application. He liked a lot of things on July 2nd. I'm not sure why, but I think he was in a good mood. Um, so let's go back to the example of this make uh, this my, my web application. So let's say some user has favorited a photo, and now the stream is showing you what they've done. And this stream is configured to show all of this particular user's activities. He favored a photo. And the most popular activity, which is Django ate some, some child. <laughs> um, let's get into the response request cycle here, because it's really, you know, there's a lot, it's a bit more complicated than just posting or deleting, sending a delete uh, request. So the module uh, actually uses a WebSocket connection with the Horizon surface. Um, the module, because of this, we, we have like a bi-directional communication. So the module can ask, hey, give me all of my activities, or give me all the activities of people I follow. And what you're going to get back is a payload from the Horizon service. Now, this is where the API endpoints really come into play. Again, we don't store any, we're not storing images, we're not storing model data, we're actually just storing some API endpoint that we will call out. So the, the Horizon service, I mean the module, will call out to all these external applications that your models are on and ask for them, hey, describe this image. So it's really important now to see like why you need these API endpoints. And this is why this, these snippets in this module can kind of live in multiple web applications. They don't really need to know anything else. They just communicate through this mechanism. And when we get this response back, um, we cache, we cache all this in local storage. So you don't have to be constantly making these. You know, if you reload the page modules on, you're not going to have to constantly make all these calls out to these external services. We cache all that locally. So this actually brings up a ton of problems and interesting considerations that we want to stress if you want to start using any of these, any of these softwares. Um, one of them is that the API obviously is really chatty. The module is really chatty. You need you're supporting an ecosystem where there's multiple web applications. So be aware of that. You're going to be making lots of calls out. You might be making some cores calls out. So just be aware of architecting that out. Um, and because we're relying on all these external applications, how do you deal with failure? What do you do when the service, when this other application fails? What do you display on the stream? Do you, do you, do you display some cache results? You know, these are all really important considerations to think about. And I mean, there's, I'm just going to go over a few more. So Ben had mentioned this, you know, the service is not really aware of changes on content. If some photo gets updated here or some video's title gets changed, how do you reflect that back to the service? And if you're already displaying that on the stream, you know, what do you do? How do you, how do you change up? How do you, how do you change what's being displayed? How do you invalidate the cache? And a really simple example, even like sorting and kind of ranking. Let's say I want to display the most recent popular activities on a stream and someone generates a new activity. Where does that come up? Do you, do you immediately put that at the top? But wait, you have, you're using an algorithm that's like, hey, I want to only show the most popular one. So how do you kind of navigate this realm? And then again, how do you, a lot of this has to do with how do you invalidate the cache? Um, Basically, the point is there's a lot of business logic between the, ser the service and these front-end modules. And so what you really need to do is determine what kind of updates, models, and things you care about so you can display them to the user. The good thing is that we've built the Horizon service in a way where the back-end, the service itself, and the client-side modules are really configurable, and so you have a lot of opportunity to kind of like tweak what you need. Um, is this running live? Yes, it is running live. You can go check out ngmbeta.com. Um, NGM is the online version of the magazine. 
where you can see all these issues going back to like 80, 1888. So we encourage you to go on and become a member and start uh, clicking on and favoriting uh, activities. Um, this is what the stream looks like. This isn't released yet. They're still kind of working on this. But eventually, this will be displayed on, on the user profile page. So that's pretty much the agenda. Oops. Yeah, that's pretty much the agenda. And uh, one more thing to note that all the projects we've spoken about, all four of them, all four, all four repos, are open source. We definitely take contribution uh, contributes. There's a lot we need to do. And we're also building out our Django Horizon app that allows Django to speak um, because we have so many Django applications in Nat Geo. So um, that's it. And if you have any questions, and we'll, I guess we'll supply the answers. But. <laughs> <laughs> <I'll> try. <laughs>